Kneel before Zor! You can't go! All the plants are gonna die! I'm gonna take a bath. Bad dates. I'll alert the media. Boys, keep off the moors. It's evil! Don't touch it! The name's Pliskin. No! Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're re-watching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in chronological order, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today we're discussing Bloody Birthday, released April 28, 1981. It was written by Ed Hunt and Barry Pearson, directed by Hunt, and released by Rearguard Productions. Jessica Alba was born the day this film was released. Bwah, bwah, bwah. She's a murderer. Probably, as a result. But was there also an eclipse? No, no, not at all. And other babies born on that day? Probably. <laughs> I need to figure out which celebrity turned exactly I 10. I guarantee there was at least one other baby born that day. Chances are... It's like The trick question is, like, how many birthdays are there in a year? 365. That's right. Depending on the year. Early working title was Happy Birthday, but that was changed to avoid confusion with 1981's Happy Birthday to me, but I'm not sure that fixed the problem. Because <laughs> Bloody Birthday and Happy Birthday to me being a horror film makes yeah. me confuse them anyway. I might have gone with the French title, which translates to The Killers of the Eclipse. Sure. Yeah. Do you guys recall the last time that someone was driven to murder by an eclipse? Sphinx? That's right. Or no. Sorry. Wrong. Oh. No, sorry, not Sphinx. The other one. God damn it. So we watch this stuff s- such quick succession. Um, Awakening? Yeah. Awakening. I get those two mixed up in my head. Thank you. Richard. I don't, even though I said yes when you said Sphinx. <laughs> <laughs> but I will edit that part out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this part. <laughs> I, just, I just have Jesse say Sphinx over and over again. Sphinx? 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 And then I'll cut in me saying this. Stop guessing Sphinx, Jesse. You're <laughs> freaking everybody out. <laughs> Apparently, this version was cut down from a much more graphic version with gorier kills. Uh, so I went down a bit of a rabbit hole because I was doing my little research and I went on to IMDb and the trailer that IMDb has for this film is not something I would call an official trailer. <laughs> uh, it It starts off with the OCP logo from RoboCop. <laughs> and I was like, what? Was there an actual production company that used this logo before RoboCop? Well, it looks like what the the trailer is for maybe for a TV distribution of it or something like that or like a re-release. It doesn't look like it's the original release yeah. to me. Yeah. And and but it's it's weird because it, it doesn't seem like the OCP logo was coming off the tail end of a showing of RoboCop right. and then no, going yeah. in. It looks like a production company logo. But also the quality of the film or uh, of the trailer film is very much like a VHS level. Yeah. And I don't know if that was like a post effect. But the graphic design of the title at the end of the trailer mm-hmm. looks to me more modern than yeah. what we're seeing in 81. Well, and it looks like there's additional footage spliced in. Correct. There, there's some additional like video shot. Like it almost looks like something for like Monster Vision or some other type of special show that was gonna be talking about the film yeah very weird that's funny though that they would use the ocp logo on there we open the film on meadowvale hospital on june 9th 1970 as a doctor pulls up outside in a convertible coincidentally this is the day my father could first legally drink alcohol (laughs) june 9th 1970 he turned 21 that day happy birthday dad At the front door, a nurse informs him that they currently have three women in labor, and he advises her against staring at the eclipse. (laughs) We cut to a time lapse by a series of crossfades as the moon blocks out the sun, and we overhear the doctor moving from hospital room to hospital room to deliver a boy, a girl, and a boy. Eight days shy of ten years later, we fade to a cemetery in Meadowvale, California, June 1st, 1980. A couple, Annie Smith and Duke Benson, are making out at the foot of a tree. He introduces her to the ambulance game, which is a fun game about ignoring consent. He tells her that his hand is an ambulance, 
and that as he drives it up the surface of her thigh, she is instructed to say red light when she wants the ambulance to stop. But when she does... Red light. I've heard an ambulance stopping for a red light. They kiss some more. So smooth. Yeah. This guy needs Miss 45 on his case. Yeah. They kiss some more, and he pulls out one of her boobs. Things start getting hot and heavy, and they decide to relocate into a, an open grave <laughs> where they're less likely to get caught. Yeah, it's like, you're already in a graveyard, which is like, does this... Does Isn't this, this sexy enough for you? <laughs> yeah, does this do it for you? But that it, to, to go into an open grave to to continue this, I, I don't I don't get it. I guess it would be warmer, maybe? I think it's just, it's just to stay out of the line of sight out, yeah, from the Yeah, it's less road. out of view. But... I'm not a cemetery owner operator. Do you leave the graves open at night or do you dig them in the morning that something's going into them? I, think, I mean, maybe you, you do leave some open. But but or you would it, maybe cover it like some was, something. It, it just seems weird to me that they would leave open holes like that. Not that people necessarily get trapped in these all the time. The POV of someone else in the graveyard approaches the grave and dirt starts to fall in on the lovemakers. Duke assumes this is the work of someone named Willard and stands to pick a fight, but is suddenly smashed twice across the face with a shovel and collapses back into the hole. And it's amazing fully work on this shovel. Yeah. It's one one sound short of just me actually going whoopsh, whoopsh. <laughs> Annie stands, startled, and a rope is looped around her neck, and then she's lifted off the ground and hung until dead. Duke regains consciousness and grabs onto Annie to pull her down, which is actually just hanging her worse. But eventually they both collapse into the hole, and dirt is pushed in on top of them as the rope is lifted out of the grave. We push into a house in the suburbs where Joyce Russell is putting the finishing touches on a peanut butter and pickle sandwich. She leaves both jars open on the counter because she's a monster, and we get a quick insert of the pickle knife on the counter, and then cut to the dinner table where she sits down to work on the horoscope of one Willard Simpson. She's wearing chunky headphones so she doesn't hear the kitchen window slide open as her brother Timmy sneaks into the house. He accidentally kicks the knife off the counter, drawing Joyce's attention. She asks what he's been up to, and he lies that he was feeding the dog and got locked out. She rushes him off to bed, and we cut to the next day as Joyce leaves Meadowvale High School and jogs down the street to Thomas Edison Elementary School, where Sheriff Brody is standing at the head of the class and asks the students the importance of cooperating with the police. He calls on Curtis, and Curtis answers that the job of the police is to protect people, which might have been the popular theory in 1981, but according to the town of Castle Rock versus Gonzalez, the Supreme Court decided 7-2 that police agencies are not obligated to provide protection of citizens. That's right. Joyce approaches the teacher's desk and is called out for getting here late, even though she left high school exactly when the bell rang and ran the whole way here. I'm not sure how she could have made it any faster. But the bell doesn't dismiss her. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It's simply, what she, how does she put it? I'll get to it. I got it here. <laughs> okay. The Brody presentation gets a little darker. Does anybody know what the word murder means? Debbie? It's when someone kills someone, like on TV. No, honey. Not like on TV. TV is just pretend. What does he think we are, a bunch of babies? Yeah, no shit, Sheriff. We know TVs pretend. <laughs> Sheriff Brody presents the class with a handle of a jump rope and asks if anyone recognizes it. He also informs them all of the death of the teens in the graveyard and asks if any of them were there or saw anything unusual. I think in a real investigation, this is not something anyone would ever discuss with kids like this. Yeah. Except in a universe where the killers happen to be children. <laughs> the bell rings and Miss Davis addresses the class. That bell does not mean that you are dismissed. It is only a signal for me to dismiss you. She thanks Sheriff Brody for speaking with the class, and Debbie says goodbye to her sheriff father on the way out. Bye, Dad. Bye, honey. Davis makes the kids sit up straight in their desks before dismissing them. Joyce grabs Timmy on his way out of the classroom and asks where he was the night before. He's sticking to his dog feeding story. Joyce tells Timmy that if mom or dad call, not to tell them about the murders because dad has a bad heart. 
implying that the school didn't even check with parents before involving the entire class in a local murder investigation. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you, if you have to think about this, too, in a wider sense, these aren't the only three kids who were born on that eclipse. I mean, obviously, eclipses only happen within a certain range on the Earth when they're right. happening. But it's possible they were the only ones born in the exact in the exact circle right of the eclipse. Circums, yeah, you know, like in the in the in the in the, in the umbra, in mm-hmm. like the 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 omen moment when mm-hmm. when the the, the om- omen the, the omen. <laughs> 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 oh, when the when the second coming of Christ, but this is like the first coming of murder babies. I don't know <laughs> murder babies. <laughs> what if what if uh, what if Satan did come back, but then the the fetus split into three, and then there were three Damians. Yeah, that. Yeah, that sounds plausible. All right, <laughs> who do we pitch this to? Um, so I have a question. Uh-huh. So there were three children. I guess Disney owns the Omen now. <laughs> <laughs> it was a Fox movie, wasn't it? So there were three children born, right? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And there's three children that we come to find out are are, are monstrous murderers, right? So the poster for this movie looks like this. So there are three children over a four children. There are three children over a birthday. Uh, well, not a birthday cake. A woman with candles on her chest. That's what I call a birthday cake. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's a fourth child, like man, young man, child standing behind them. Who is that? I don't know. I don't know who the lady is. I, I, in fact, honestly, I, I'm not even entirely sure that any of these children are the children from this movie. I cannot tell. Yeah, that's weird. <laughs> but this is, I don't understand this poster for this movie. But bookmark that cake for my next party. <laughs> How about the, the, the other poster for this movie with where the, it's a cake with, with fingers finger are on candles. fire? <laughs> I like the other title for this movie too, Angst. That, that's, a, that's another title for this? Yeah. That's great. That really sells it. After class, Debbie, Curtis, and Steven, the killer kids, Spoilers. not to be confused with the Kipper kids. Well, and, and here's the, I, I, another question. Sorry, to, I know we're trying to get back onto the story here. Do they, did they like find each other? Like, well, they found each other in that the city has decided they will have joint birthday parties because they were born on the same day. Right, right. But when did they all like come together and go, hey? I like to murder people. Do you? It's like, oh yeah, I totally like to murder people. I think it's people. like an yeah. unspoken thing, like the kids from prom night. Okay, so you, you think that they have some kind of like they have a pact, like a psychic link. But all of the summaries of this film make they imply that this is not something they've been doing the whole time. That their killer instinct kicked in on on their tenth birthdays or thereabouts. Oh, they, so they obviously this been is before their tenth. To this point, I, I don't know. Oh, okay. I just know that marketing materials imply that this is something that happened a decade after they were born, and not something that's been going on the whole time. Oh, okay. So the poster is the international poster, and I'm definitely looking closer at these children. These are totally not the kids from this movie. Okay, which is why there's four of them, and they don't look anything like the children in that this actual sense. movie. It's probably a poster <laughs> for a different movie that they were like. This could work for just bloody put some birthday, candles right? on your boobs. We're good. <laughs> there you go. Uh, the poster already had candles on the boobs. Perfect. <laughs> After class, Debbie, Curtis, and Stephen ask Miss Davis if the class can be excused from homework on Monday to attend their triple birthday party. What kind of dumbass parents organize a joint birthday party for three kids on a Monday afternoon during the school year on a Monday? Is it on a Monday? Yeah. These kids get a Sunday party or they get nothing at all. Okay. <laughs> Miss Davis shuts that shit down, but Debbie takes it in stride. And just because you all have the same birthday doesn't mean that you're special. Okay. Have a nice day, Miss Davis. Thank you, dear. After class, Curtis and Stephen head back to Debbie's house to partake in cookies and a strip show. Debbie has apparently cut a hole in the back wall of her older sister's closet wall and charges her classmates 25 cents apiece to watch her sister undress in her room. There was a very awkward moment for me watching this film when she brings them into the closet with the hole and asks for the money and these kids just start reaching into their pants. I was like, oh, oh, wait, what's what happening? What is this about? What is happening? <laughs> uh, and I was like, oh, God, they're bringing money out. Oh, thank God. I thought I, I for because I, I don't know what kind of movie this like, oh, that's is. That's weird. He's got a roll of dimes there. Oh, God, that's not a roll of dimes. <laughs> I was like, I, this movie is not going to do that, is it? It was like really upsetting. <laughs> 
Steven watches for a while as Beverly dances topless to music in her room until Curtis yanks him away from the peephole for his turn. Beverly starts to pull down her panties when Debbie takes them away from the hole, informing them that it's another 10 cents to keep watching. Curtis happily pays up, and sure enough, Sister strips completely down, giving Curtis an eyeful of ass before Beverly starts putting on another outfit and his coin runs out again. Beverly sees Joyce walking by outside and asks her to wait up. Yeah, so she's, not, not only is she doing something which I don't think is very realistic, like dancing around nude in her bedroom, right. but the window's would... open. <laughs> That's <laughs> not realistic. Yeah, nobody does that. It's dark outside, and it's well lit in her room. It's just like the whole neighborhood could be seeing her naked. They don't have to pay 10 cents. The kids could be standing in the bushes. <laughs> I don't I don't think she cares. I don't think Beverly cares a whole lot about I'm any of this. I'm just saying, you save some money. And just stand outside. <laughs> I don't know. I think you teach your sister the value of a dollar first. That's what I would do. <laughs> this show is worth more than 35 cents. You're Julie Brown. Did I mention this is Julie Brown who gets yeah. completely naked in this scene? Uh, I also was hoping that when she makes the discovery about the hole that she goes and she finds out about the money. I was like wondering. I thought she was going to make a line about getting her cut. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Beverly sees Joyce walking outside and asks her to wait up. They walk together and agree that the double murders are terrifying, especially to Beverly, who spends a fair amount of time in the graveyard with her boyfriend, Willard. Why? Well, not to get buried, that's for sure. She asks if Joyce finished his horoscope yet, and she confirms that Willard should be interested in a Scorpio like Beverly. Very quickly, we learn that Joyce has one and a half boyfriends. Paul hasn't called in a while because he's studying for finals, and Beverly implies that that might not be all he's doing. I get the impression that this might mean that her boyfriend is actually away at college because I think it would be harder to cheat on someone in this small town. Beverly also brings up that Paul wouldn't be happy to learn Joyce has been working on a paper with Mr. Harding. Beverly, Mr. Harding's married. <laughs> yeah, but he sure is cute. And has he ever got the hots for you? Beverly tries to get Joyce to admit that she thinks Harding is cute too. Suddenly, Sheriff Brody pulls up beside them and reminds his daughter Beverly to be home on time tonight because there's a murderer on the loose. We see Brody pull up to his home and chastise his wife for leaving the front door open, which he claims defeats the purpose of their security system. Okay, so their security system is super bonkers. Yeah, it's like the 13 Ghosts security system. Yeah, it, you turn this key and it magnetically locks down the entire house. All the Very doors weird. and windows. Yeah. Insane fire hazard. And, and the windows are unbreakable bulletproof glass. Yeah. What so is this guy afraid of happening? Yeah, but, and this is the only use for the security system is when you're in the house, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're not going to magnetically close all the doors from the inside after you leave. Also, wouldn't you only use it when you're asleep at night in the house? You wouldn't use it like when everyone's awake, including your cop husband. So he acts like it's stupid of her to leave the door open. It's like, can we never open this door? Because you're here and I'm awake. No one's breaking in here in the middle of the day. Mrs. Brody apologizes, but she's been distracted planning for the triple birthday party, which is apparently such a fascinating event that everybody in town is expected to attend. Outside, we see someone place a skateboard across the concrete steps to the house. Debbie calls her father out, and he successfully evades the skateboard on his way down the steps. Yeah, I was like, I was like, oh, was that intentional? Yeah, was, or? He, was he looking where he's stepping like someone who's using stairs might do, or did he just happen to walk around it? He asks her what's wrong, and she tosses the rest of the jump rope on the ground. Funny that the cop expected children to recognize the jump rope handle used to kill the teens in the graveyard and somehow didn't recognize it as belonging to his own daughter. <laughs> it's like, does anyone recognize this? Oh, I bought this. <laughs> this is ours. Crap. Ignore this. <laughs> he leans down to inspect it, and when he asks where she got it, Steve comes in with a bat and just demolishes Sheriff Brody's head with it. He smashes him over and over as Debbie smiles down at her dying father. The birthday kids drag Brody's corpse to the steps outside the house, and just as they're positioning it, Timmy comes through the gate at the end of the yard to see what they're up to. Debbie shouts to her mother. Mom! Daddy fell! Mom! Daddy fell! We hard cut to Brody's funeral. Yeah. Don't you think that smashing a man repeatedly yeah. in the head with a baseball bat does not look consistent with slipping on a skateboard on some concrete steps i think that the coroner's hitting the bottle in this town <laughs> uh and because yeah you're right there there's no way you could confuse 
multiple contusions of blunt force trauma of a bat smashing a yeah. person's face in with oh i slipped and hit a concrete step it's and, not unless, the same thing unless it's like a whole flight of stairs <laughs> or, or it, unless that bat had like a one it just had a corner on it he just, just put a concrete corner on it yeah just hitting it with a corner <laughs> to make sure it was consistent Very i like clever. this idea clever too bad you only have like a half a step up to your house. <laughs> it doesn't quite All work. All right, I'll have to think of something more clever to kill you undetected. We hard cut to Brody's funeral. Debbie looks toward Curtis and Steve through fake tears, and they look at Timmy and then nod at each other as if a plan is settled. We cut to Curtis, Steve, Timmy, and another kid playing hide-and-seek in a junkyard. Steve is counting down, and Curtis doesn't want witnesses, so he points a gun at the other kid, who I think is named Jimmy. Uh, he points a gun at Jimmy and then tells him not to copy their hiding spot. So Jimmy's just like, fuck this. And he <laughs> leaves to go home. Curtis convinces Timmy to hide in an old refrigerator and then buckles it closed. We cut to the high school where Joyce is having a horoscope chat with Mr. Harding. She tells him that every 20 years, a certain arrangement of planets predicts bad luck. And that as a result, every president elected those years dies in office. It turns out this was sort of true at the time, though the deaths didn't begin until 1840. They lasted straight through every 20 years until John Hinckley Jr. fucked up the pattern less than a month prior to this film's release. In 1840, William Henry Harrison was elected and later contracted pneumonia and died after exactly one month in office. There's William Henry Harrison! I died in 30 days! As a result, the series of deaths is sometimes referred to as the Curse of Tippecanoe or the Curse of Tecumseh, after the Shawnee leader against whom Harrison fought in the 1811 Battle of Tippecanoe. Harrison was the first president to die in office and sparked a constitutional crisis because it was not clear from the text if the vice president should be sworn in as president or if he should simply take over the duties of the vacated office. Ultimately, it was decided that VP John Tyler would be sworn in as the new president. 20 years later, in 1860, Abraham Lincoln was elected and later famously died of autoerotic asphyxiation. <laughs> In 1880, James Garfield was elected and was assassinated less than four months into his term. In 1900, William McKinley... It's just... It's so rude. <laughs> oh, was it too soon? <clears throat> In 1900, William McKinley was elected and assassinated a year later. In 1920, Warren G. Harding was elected, after whom Mr. Harding here might even be named, and died in office three years later of a sudden heart attack. In 1940, FDR was elected and died in office five years later from a cerebral hemorrhage. The most recent president to die in office, as of this recording, was JFK, who was elected in 1960, meaning Joyce here predicted that Reagan would die in office, but he didn't. 18, Although he was shot. He was shot a month earlier, but but uh, he messed it up. Screwed up the pattern. <laughs> ruined the curse. The 1850 passing of Zachary Taylor is the only presidential death in office to occur outside of the curse. It was this series of presidential deaths that served as the initial seed for what became the script of the film. Mr. Harding invites Joyce out for a Coke to discuss the topic further, but she has to get home to her brother. We cut to the elementary school, where Curtis is showing off a project he built. It's basically just a series of blinking lights nailed to a board, but we are to infer that he is a super genius. <laughs> His grandfather is very impressed. Do you guys recall the last time that an invention covered in blinking lights was supposed to imply that a kid was a genius? Home movies? Was there one in home movies? Oh, maybe it wasn't home movies. Are you thinking of the other Brian De Palma movie with the same actor? I am. It was definitely dressed to kill. That's right. <laughs> Because it was the same guy. <laughs> yeah, playing the same part. We cut back to the junkyard where Timmy is still struggling with the inside of the refrigerator. He pulls out a small flashlight from his pocket. Joyce gets home just in time to answer a phone call from Dad, who might actually be Kevin McAllister on a talk boy. There's yeah. a very weird voice filter being used here. I, I, I couldn't tell what that was supposed to be. It's like, how you feeling, Daddy? Oh, I'm getting along okay. You got everything under control? Sure. It almost felt like they had to have another actor fill in, but it's like, but we can't, don't want to confuse the people and have it think that it's you. I almost feel like whenever they needed to record this, that they only had a woman available, so they had to pitch it down, because mm. it doesn't even sound human the way they changed the voice. And women are not human. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was waiting for that line. Oh my God. 
<laughs> Gonna get a lot of mail about this episode. <laughs> they ask to say hi to Timmy, but she lies that he's out playing outside. I mean, I guess he is. <laughs> Unless, does a refrigerator count as indoors? I don't know. I don't know the rules. <laughs> Timmy notices a metal strap screwed to the inside of the fridge and unscrews it with a coin from his pocket that he was planning on spending looking at some bush <laughs> later. <laughs> screwed it up. This is like, this isn't a traditional fridge either. This is like a big double door yeah, fridge that you have. Yeah, it's a scary like, one. It's like an industrial fridge. Correct. It's got yeah. two But it also, it, it locks from the outside. So it's specifically for killing people, probably. This is why you're supposed to remove the doors of refrigerators when you dispose of them. I know this punky Brewster. I'm not doing this to people. <laughs> he wrote a whole film about it. Yeah. He made it. My senior project was about people dying in refrigerators. Oh, okay. This is why when we got rid of our last fridge, you, I couldn't get the door off or something like that. I, I couldn't get the door off. So your dad came over and padlocked it shut and didn't like provide the key. And then yeah. he put it on the corner. <laughs> and it's great because up. there was already somebody inside. <laughs> <laughs> and they can't open and it they won't they check. Don't yeah. <laughs> I guess we'll never know what's inside this fridge oozing red fluids <laughs> Timmy notices a metal strap screwed into the inside of the fridge and unscrews it with a coin he sticks the strip of metal through the crack in the refrigerator doors and manages to jimmy the lock open or Timmy the lock open because Jim, <laughs> Jimmy left so it's just Timmy now the music here is very relieved and celebratory, but I just wanted Steve to start wailing on him with a bat right here. <laughs> <laughs> like like the dad who missed the skateboard earlier. Just in case he gets out, you wait here. Timmy makes it home again, and Joyce asks where he's been, but this time he's honest about everything. He tells her that Curtis locked him in a fridge in the junkyard, and further, he admits where he was the night of the murder. Apparently, he went to Debbie's house, intending to pay money to see through the peephole, but Debbie wasn't home. Instead of being disgusted or using this as a teaching moment, Joyce just laughs at him. <laughs> you paid money to spy on a girl against her will. That's funny. She promises not to tell their folks if he stops playing with Curtis, especially at the junkyard. We cut to the birthday kids in a treehouse making fun of Miss Davis. They vaguely threaten their teacher while Debbie glues a photo of Miss Davis into a scrapbook. She flips back a page to reveal a cutout article about Sheriff Brody's death by freak accident. The accompanying article reads, Future plans will, of necessity, have great bearing on the situation as it now stands. Decisions will have to be made of the actual planning of the project, which will take considerable time. But it is felt that these steps are important. Do you guys recall the last time we <laughs> saw a killer keep track of related newspaper clippings? Schizoid? No, that was just cutting things out for notes um uh, i almost have it i can picture the scene it was the howling it was in the howling yeah he had it all over his wall but do you remember the one before that he only actually ended up taking one clipping and it bothered us because we thought he was going to keep collecting them oh was it fade to black it was fade to black in the middle of the night curtis knocks on debbie's door and verifies that her mom is sleeping before turning off the security system and inviting Curtis inside. Curtis swaps his toy gun for her deceased father's service weapon. The next day, Curtis finds Miss Davis doing dishes in what I'm assuming is some kind of faculty break room. He points a gun at her, and she's not amused because she's seen this toy gun that he often points at people. She instructs him to leave the gun at home or she will confiscate it, and he pretends to put it away in a jacket, which in reality he intends to use as a silencer. As soon as she turns away, he shoots her in the back and she collapses on the floor. Immediately, the other two kids show up to start cleaning up the murder scene. Debbie heads outside to the playground just as Joyce and Timmy arrive on campus. She calls to Timmy and they wander away together as Joyce moves into the faculty room. Weirdly, the kids thought far enough ahead to wipe up all the blood, but now the counter is just littered with blood sponges. Like, well, they're all covered in gross she blood. She wasn't doing dishes. She was mixing red paint in a cup. And so I think that the implication was this is like an art room sink. <laughs> and like mm. that is red paint, but it's actually blood. So when she comes to like clean it up, she's like, oh, somebody made a mess with all this yeah. paint. Joyce is confused by the scene, and behind her we see Stephen hiding in a cabinet pointing the gun at her. Suddenly... Curtis bursts out the door, and Joyce follows him out. We see Curtis walk right up to her brother, but when she ducks back inside, Timmy just starts wailing on Curtis. Yeah. Debbie just watches the beating unfold until an older faculty member arrives to break up the fight. 
Back in the faculty room, we get a psycho-ish score as Steve points the gun at Joyce again, but she crosses the room to open another cabinet and Miss Davis's body just falls right out into the room. Yeah, she's been like stood up yeah. to yeah. fall forward to whoever opens this door. Well, I feel like we've already established that these kids must have super strength from the eclipse because they lifted a teenage woman like off of her feet through a you know a jump rope. I out think of a that grave. was cooperation. Yeah, I think two of them or holding... three possibly. Okay, so well, if two or three of them can lift a woman off of the ground with a jump rope, then they can stand a woman up in an art I closet. don't disagree, <laughs> especially if rigor mortis had set in and she was stiff as a board. But if she's not, it would and be And light as a hard. feather? Yeah, I was going to say it, damn it. <laughs> no, she wouldn't be light as a feather. That's well, not part they, of rigor mortis. They, they chant, and then that happens. Mm-hmm. And then... Rigor mortis makes you weigh one pound all of a sudden. <laughs> or at least 21 grams less. That's true. Because you shit yourself. 21 grams of shit every time you die. <laughs> Dietitians don't want you to know this one secret. <laughs> Lose 21 grams instantly. <laughs> <laughs> By hanging yourself like a blanket. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, <laughs> is this a reference to something? No, no it's, it's just, just I don't have to explain to people how Lincoln died. They know how Lincoln died. <laughs> okay. So I get to pick whatever I want as a funny joke. Eh. People will laugh at that, especially since Jess laughed at it. I got my own laugh track right there, built in. Shut up. I'm going to specifically try not to laugh at you. <laughs> they won't Don't work. do that. I've That'll tried. hurt the show. <laughs> Joyce runs screaming from the room. And then we see Steve step out of his hiding place carrying a lunchbox. We see a police car pull into Joyce and Timmy's driveway, and it looks like a deputy has given Joyce a ride home. Or is he the sheriff now? Or is Steve the sheriff now because he killed the previous sheriff? Is that the right of succession? (laughs) Did he just take the star off of her dad's chest and pin it to himself and... Well, I thought this lunchbox thing was going to come into play. I thought, oh, they're going to put the gun in Timmy's lunchbox. Oh, I thought it was just a way to move the gun from room to room. I, I realize that that's what it is now. Yeah. But I thought for sure they were going to, like, frame Timmy. That would work. On the front door, she finds a note that reads, Joyce, I'm playing at the junkyard. Timmy. Instead of suddenly remembering that she left her brother at the school with a murderer and rushing back for him, she assumes that the note is authentic and and that her brother has not only broken his promise, but uncharacteristically left a note to announce it. And left it outside of the house? Yeah. We cut to Timmy walking down an alley behind Debbie's yard, and she notices him from her treehouse and invites him up. At first, it seems like this scene is going to get crazy dark, because in a row, she asks if he knows how to play doctor, and then admits that she knows how to play ambulance, as though she intends to play either of those games with Timmy here. Timmy positions himself in the easiest kill position possible, precariously balanced on the treehouse railing overlooking a sharp tree that he could easily be impaled on. Suddenly, they hear the phone ring, but neither of them moves to answer it. It still ends up saving Timmy's life, but maybe Debbie was just trying to slow him down for a bit, because we cut to Joyce calling his name at the junkyard. A child wearing a white sheet over his head with eye holes cut in it sits up in the driver's seat of an old car, Joyce finds the fridge that Timmy described with part of his flashlight and the bent metal strap inside. I feel like if I was this kid, I would keep that strap in my pocket forever. Yeah. Because you never know when they're going to lock you in their refrigerator again. Yeah. This costume of the, the kid with the sheet over his head, because it's got like a rope tied around yeah, his neck. Yeah, it comes, to keep comes back right away. It, yeah, well, not only does it come back right away in the next movie, it, it, they both occurrences uh, remind me of the trick or treat character. Oh, totally. oh, yeah, yeah. And I'm just wondering if, if either of these instances, this one or, or the next movie, um, I'm sure trick or treat it. is a Jason reference. It's probably a Jason yeah. reference. You're right. I like that movie. Trick or treat? Yeah. Hmm. I, again, you know how old I am on horror yeah, you films. You don't like horror films, but I think it's it's just campy enough hmm. that that it's a lot of fun. We get an insert of kid hands hot wiring the car. They get it started, and then a second pair of hands operate the pedals. The old wreck comes lurching around the fridge and chases Joyce through the junkyard. Instead of trying to survive, she keeps running into the path of the vehicle, either ahead of it or behind it. 
She eventually finds some old steel cables and quickly stuffs her foot into a knot of wire. <laughs> it could not look more intentional, and it seems like she just resigned herself to death by a car, but then second guesses it and pulls her foot back out. I mean, yeah, this is like people always running in the road when somebody's chasing them with a car. I'm like, there's piles of junk everywhere. If you climb to the top of one of these yeah. things, a the car, car can't get you there. Get you. But also, if I'm the camera person here, you don't watch her step into this knot. You see her running and then suddenly get caught on something and then her foot is yeah. already tied up in the stuff. Oh, yeah, you no, don't it's... show her carefully step into it. <laughs> it was very poorly, uh, poorly executed shot. The kids prop the car against some junk and then tie the pedal down. They escape the car before they yank a cord tied to the gear shift to put it back in drive. And then it rolls after Joyce toward a ledge. And after she jumps out of the way, the car crashes over it just as the police pull up. The same cop that just dropped her off at home confirms that there's nobody in the car that just crashed. It seems like Officer Duncan has been incommunicado for a while because he suddenly receives info on like five calls at once. Yeah, they're saying that they have a suspect and then the mayor's office... No, call- they're, they're saying they... They're saying, do we have a suspect? Okay. God damn it, Duncan, where the hell are you? Here, uh, over. Okay, what we'll call from Deirdre Wilson or across from the graveyard. Think she saw a psycho lurking. I got it, Dave. Call from Cookie Lamar. A psycho minister wants you to take me a shower. Call from the press. We have a suspect. Call from your wife. We have a suspect. Call from the mayor. We have an expletive deleted suspect. In the bedroom, we see Curtis practicing drawing his gun on people as fast as possible. Do you guys recall the last time we saw a character practicing pointing their gun at people in a bedroom mirror? I assume that it's our last movie. Miss 45, that's right. Curtis climbs out of his window and we cut to Joyce and Timmy watching the news. This is where we learn that Miss Davis's first name is Viola, <laughs> which is amusing <laughs> because there's a famous actress with that name. Do you guys recall the last time that a character coincidentally shared the name with a famous actor from the future? Or at least the most recent time I can recall. There was an inspector named Robert Townsend in the fiendish plot oh. of Dr. Fu Manchu. Joyce tells Timmy that he isn't going anywhere by himself, and we cut to Curtis prowling the neighborhood with his gun drawn. He finds a girl playing catch with Jimmy in the dark. He cocks the gun and points it at them, but Jimmy's dad calls them inside, and Curtis aborts the mission. Back at Joyce and Timmy's place, she is reading him horoscope profiles and asking him to guess who they apply to. Then we get an awkward little misunderstanding here. You are extremely concerned about your attractiveness. Totally confident and enormously seductive. You, right? (laughs) Wrong. Beverly. Yeah! We see a POV through the hole in Beverly's closet wall as she cries about her father's death. Her boyfriend Willard sits nearby, half-assedly consoling her. Beverly complains that her sister didn't even seem to care, and we see Debbie pick up an arrow and stick it through the hole to push some of Beverly's hanging clothes out of the way. Beverly and Willard start making out hardcore, and Debbie leans in close to watch. We cut back to Joyce, who has just finished making Debbie's chart. Considering everyone in town knows that these three kids were born simultaneously, and birth time is literally the only metric that correlates to a horoscope, (laughs) it's weird that she didn't just call this the chart for all three kids. She says that the eclipse during their birth means that the sun and moon were both blocking Saturn, which controls emotions. Curtis sees Timmy taking out the trash and then spies on him and his sister sitting in the living room with horoscopes spread all over the floor. He raises the gun toward the window and we get a bit of the Jaws score here. Until he finds himself lit up by the headlights of a car pulling out of the driveway across the street. He runs away again until he sees a blue van pull up and park by a white picket fence. A boy and girl inside move to the back seat and begin making out and stripping down to nothing. Yeah, perfect place to have sex in a van, in the middle of a suburban street. Yeah, where no one will call the police on you. (laughs) They see that van a-rockin'. Curtis watches through the windshield for a moment, and when he jumps down, the girl says she thinks she heard someone and makes her boyfriend go check for strangers, but he doesn't see anybody, And when he returns to her, he starts sucking on one of her boobs before he lays her back down across the van. Curtis jostles the back door, frightening the couple again. And when the guy pushes the door open, Curtis shoots the guy right in the forehead. The girl cowers, screaming, 
and Curtis follows her into the van, firing round after round. We crossfade to a kitchen table with multiple birthday cakes. Curtis sticks a knife in one and then licks off some of the frosting. So, okay, so now we're at the birthday, and we are how many days post-father's death? Like, two days? Well, uh, like it, a week after. Well, yeah, because... Because uh, it was supposed to be, like, the following... He died on the 1st, and their birthday is on the 9th. Oh, okay. I just think it's odd that you would continue with this birthday party after his death. Like, I feel like you'd, you'd want to postpone it or change it. The and... show must go on. Mm. Or have somebody else take it over. Like, like don't do it at like, your house. Yeah. That's true. That's weird that they're still being asked to host it. Yeah. The audience is standing room only. Everybody gives so much of a shit about the novelty of three kids born at the same time that they all left work early on a Monday to be here. Back in the kitchen, Curtis eyeballs a bottle of ant poison. Joyce and Beverly are hanging out in Bev's room when Joyce notices the hole in the wall and points it out to Beverly. You know your little sister, Debbie's been uh, charging the little boys 25 cents to watch you undress? The look Beverly gives her seems a lot more like, yes, how did you know that, than, oh no, I'm so embarrassed. And she proceeds to do absolutely nothing about the hole in the wall or even confront her sister about it. Debbie pulls Curtis aside to mention that Joyce knows the truth and that she's going to tell everybody. Not if they think she's crazy. But what does Joyce even know? She knows that they locked her brother in a fridge and that people have died. But she doesn't have any concrete connection between those. And if she did, she'd already be telling people, wouldn't she? Like, why, why is she waiting around if she already knows your murderers? We see Beverly bring out the first cake of the party and the birthday kids are called over to blow out their candles. Mrs. Brody tries to take a moment to give a speech about her husband. There is one person who is not here today. And he would very much like to have been here today with us all. It's okay, man. It's okay. She is corralled away from the party because she's bumming everybody out. Who would have had her give a speech? Like I think she wanted to. No. She overestimated is, her abilities. This is dumb. Partygoers remark on how good it feels to have a party in the wake of these gruesome killings. Curtis, One of which happened last night. Yeah. yeah. Like, again, all of these people have died within a week. And, yeah. like, like, this is a large portion of this small town. Multiple murders. And, and the last killing happened right outside Joyce and Timmy's house. Yeah. They would have for sure heard the shots. Which is just down the street from this because Timmy runs over to this house all the time, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, people were murdered out front and you still have a birthday party? Man, feels good to have a party, though, doesn't it? (laughs) Well, when you know you can go at any minute, might as well celebrate. Celebrate every party like it's your last. Treat every day like it's cake day. Curtis walks through the party and finds what I can only assume was the party clown. It was clearly an afterthought, though. The production didn't pay for a clown on set. It's just a dude in makeup wearing a sleeveless shirt juggling oranges. Probably whichever guy on set had the frizziest hair. Curtis moves up to the clubhouse to supervise, and Beverly suggests they get a second cake because it's going fast. Curtis beats Joyce inside and applies frosting around the edge of the second cake, but when Joyce finds him doing it, she gets all pissy at him. Curtis... You're making a mess. He literally just drew a rectangle around the words on his own birthday cake. Chill out, lady. He starts doing the same thing to a third cake. Outside, Beverly insists she already needs the third cake, even though she's only cut one piece off of the second cake, and Joyce heads back inside. Again, she finds Curtis over-decorating the cake, but this time, he seems to be hiding something behind his back. What's the matter with you? Look at that cake. She gestures to the cake as if it's ruined and isn't just more frosted. <laughs> it's not like he's crossing out the words or anything. Yeah. I think that it was pretty presumptuous of them to assume that Joyce would be the one coming in to get the cakes and that she would come in, That's true. in, in rapid succession twice. Yeah. And alone. And and how long has he been standing in this kitchen waiting for somebody to get more cake? Well, it's his birthday party going on. Maybe he keeps urging people who aren't Joyce out, like, why don't you send Joyce in here for the cake? <laughs> She's a really good cake getter. She asks what he's hiding, and he drops the bottle of poison on the ground. She asks what he did with this poison, and he just smiles and says nothing. Joyce races outside and starts slapping cake out of everybody's hands, insisting Curtis has poisoned it. 
Joyce must lie to these people a lot because they don't even stop eating. Yeah. Curtis claims that he was just putting the poison away and Curtis's grandfather flat out tells her that she's crazy and drags his gross old hands through the icing and slaps it into his mouth. But he admitted that he had the poison. Isn't that like immediately suspicious that on your birthday you went in the kitchen and, and we're playing with poison near playing the with cake. ant poison? It really would have thrown a wrench into Curtis's plans if this old man had decided on this moment to die of an aneurysm or something. But nope, he's fine. And even Curtis follows suit, raking his filthy kid paws through the community meal and slurping the frosting off his hands right in Joyce's face as if to say, you just got punked. Somehow Joyce sees through the whole plan that Curtis has deliberately tanked her credibility as she starts shaking him violently until other party guests shove her away from him. Well, and as much as her credibility apparently is shattered, apparently it's not because this never, never comes into question right. at all. That night, Timmy tapes up black construction paper over the window to prevent creepers from spying on them. They hear a creak from inside the house and Joyce moves to investigate it. Now the score seems to be emulating James Horner type music and apparently they had approached him to compose this film but couldn't provide his going rate. Joyce sneaks around the house carrying a large trophy as a weapon. She finds the patio door open and asks if Timmy did it. Just as he denies doing it, the closet behind Joyce swings open, startling her, and Joyce almost hits her boyfriend Paul in the face with the trophy. She's in tears and hugs him tight. Is he unaware that there's been multiple murders yeah, happening he d- in he this town? Yeah, he doesn't even check his mail, like, I guess. I just, it seems like a bad idea to surprise people after a murderer's been going around. She'll be even more surprised. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Surprise, I didn't kill you. She's confused how he's even here because he's supposed to have finals. Hey, hey, what about your finals? Decided to take off. I missed you. You just skipped finals? Isn't that the significant portion of your grade in most classes? Did you just drop out of college? (laughs) Or do you intend to retake all these classes and spend more time away from your girlfriend down the line? Timmy smiles creepily and watches them kiss for a while, and she tells him to head to his room, when suddenly the audio drops to nothing, and then comes back in and the picture quality suddenly looks like it was color corrected. I don't know what happened here. There's just a weird moment. Joyce chats with Paul in her room, and he confirms my suspicion by predicting that next year will be easier because they'll both be in college, But she's recently decided, somewhat out of nowhere. I've been doing some thinking. And what I really want to do is be a reporter. Not take a bunch of stupid classes. So many problems here. (laughs) Number one, you have shown exactly zero inklings that you want to be a reporter. (laughs) Unless by reporter you mean you want to be the author of a horoscope section. (laughs) Two, no one in town believes a fucking word you say. So you'll have to start fresh somewhere else. And three, won't you need a journalism degree to work as a reporter? But I looked it up, and Joyce here is technically a boomer, so she could probably just walk right into that job. (laughs) She came to this decision in the wake of all the local deaths. She's not going to put off her plans for the future anymore. And from now on, I'm going to do what I want to do. Not plan to do what I want to do. Paul kisses her, and we crossfade to Beverly, putting on makeup, and suddenly she can't find her nail polish. She starts rifling through Debbie's drawers and comes across the scrapbook of successful kills. I won't read you the text of these articles, except to say that they're all the same placeholder stuff. Debbie catches her reading through it and says it's private property. Clippings of murders? What are you, some kind of little ghoul? Beverly hands it to her mother, which is like, don't show this to your mom. Your mom's fucking traumatized right now. She's a basket case. And Debbie claims that Curtis left it here. Mrs. Brody bans her from ever playing with Curtis again and instructs Beverly to burn it. Beverly burns the book in the fireplace and Debbie sneaks up on her with a fire poker, but Beverly catches her and steals it away. Debbie calls Curtis and tells him to get Stephen and meet at her place. I want to know who has a fire in the middle of June. Beverly. (laughs) Well, it was the only thing that was on on the fireplace was this scrapbook. The fire wasn't already going? No, no, no oh, I think she, okay. she, she started it. it. She lit Never the book mind. first and then put it in there. Uh, I, I also love how problematic it is to aggressively and angrily dial somebody on a rotary phone. Yeah. Because Debbie's just like... <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it would be harder not to aggressively dial because I just feel true. like this fucking dumb invention. 
Jesus. And she's like dialing her real number. It wasn't like like she was just going like five, five, five over right, and over right, again. Right. Like she's like going to different numbers and it's like, oh boy, this is there's too many nines in this number. It's taking you too long. <laughs> That's that Mitch Hedberg bit. Just press just two for a while. Keep pressing two for a while. Eventually I'll pick up. Debbie goes back to the closet to watch her sister again, and I wonder why they bothered to include a scene of her finding out about the hole in the wall if it doesn't affect anything moving forward. She's even undressing in front of it again. And Debbie lines up another arrow, this time with an actual bow, and she taps the arrowhead on the wall a few times to draw her sister closer. When she's finally close enough, Debbie looses the arrow and it penetrates Beverly's eye and probably brain. She is dead fairly instantly, and Debbie tucks a rag under her head to absorb blood. She hears her friends knock on the door and lets them in while Mrs. Brody takes a shower. The boys are a little disappointed to see Debbie killed her without them. Curtis plucks the arrow from the eye and hands it to Debbie, who just throws it back through the peephole into the closet (laughs) in the living room. They're carrying Beverly out in a sheet when the phone rings. Mom tells Beverly to answer it, but Debbie answers. It's the wrong number, Mom. Beverly's gone. Oh, okay. Bye. But who was this? Debbie just picked it up and immediately hung up. Whoever it was would surely call back, wouldn't they? This is the second time in a movie where a phone rang for no reason other than we needed to hear a phone ring and it didn't matter who was on the call. After her shower, she finds Debbie scrubbing Bev's blood out of the carpet, but she claims it's nail polish. And even then, she's just like, oh, I spilled some of her nail polish. She's like, oh, don't do that. Bye. And walks away. And it's like, this carpet is ruined. Yeah. You should yeah. be angrier and helping her clean it. With Even if something. you're not angry, like you're just like this girl is it's a 10 year old girl and she's just like, clean it up. And I'm like, I don't. I don't even trust myself to be able to get nail polish out of carpet perfectly. Like, this 10-year-old girl is not going to clean this properly. And she's just using a rag on the floor. You you just use nail polish remover. Yeah, you'd have to use it on (laughs) the stain. Just sprinkle it on there. Yeah, I don't think that's going to totally work, man. Just pour a whole bucket of it. The carpet's going to be discolored. Then color it. With more nail polish. (laughs) (laughs) Do you guys have carpet shade? I like it when my fingers look like carpet. It's it's like a really pukey green. (laughs) They just leave Beverly's body out in the yard, and we cut right to Beverly's funeral. I have to assume they shot all these funeral scenes the same day, probably using the same hole and coffin. Maybe even the same hole that the kids were making out in at the start of the film. Why dig more than one hole? Just keep putting bodies in there. (laughs) Yeah, the town used the same hole? No, I mean the production used the same hole. At the funeral, Mrs. Brody has a breakdown, but nothing unusual for a widow who's just lost her oldest daughter. We cut back to Meadowvale General Hospital, where apparently Mrs. Brody is being committed for some reason. I assume a psychiatric assessment or something? She says that she'll be home in a few days, and Debbie is left in the care of some random woman who we've never met. Joyce is obviously bummed about the death of her friend, and to cheer her up, Timmy offers to fix the sprinkler. (laughs) He's like, oh, I'm sorry. I'll fix the sprinkler for you. Timmy asks Joyce what it's like to be dead, and she tells him not to think about it. Back at Debbie's place, she seems to have been left alone by her caretaker. Well, was she left alone, or did she kill her? I don't know. We we never see that woman again that was supposed to be in charge of her. Curtis does a bit of rewiring in the security system panel, and then announces he's it for a game of hide-and-seek. Debbie and Steve run for the door to go outside, but Curtis's electrical work seems to have locked all the doors. What work did he need to do? He just You just turn the key and then keep the key. But he had then... to make it lock from the inside also. Yeah, so I think that maybe whenever this wiring change isn't enacted, that you could open it from the inside. Oh, but okay. when he rewired it, now it's now it's permanently locked, which I'm not entirely sure how that works. Yeah, because because in a minute, uh, Joyce will be over there and she'll turn on the system and go and test the doors. But I'm assuming yeah. that the, I was assuming that they were operating as to be expected that you cannot open them once the door once the system's engaged. I don't know. Curtis quickly finds Steve wandering around like an idiot without even trying to hide. But because this is a cross between tag and hide and seek, he taps Steve and says, "Yeah, you're it." But then continues looking for Debbie. She jumps out of a closet and runs back to the panel to turn the switch and unlock the doors again when they hear a sound outside. Timmy is throwing huge fucking rocks at the front window, but they aren't having any effect. My dad put in special glass. 
What the hell kind of doomsday prepper is your dad? He spent all this time locking up the house like the Pentagon, and then he got beat to death by a 10-year-old with a bat. <laughs> <laughs> Can't plan for everything. That's true. When Timmy runs out of throwing rocks, he books it back down the street and the killer kids follow. It's kind of funny because Timmy is following the sidewalk, even where he could save a lot of time by cutting across huge yards diagonally, but the kids chasing him do the same thing. They stay on the sidewalk because they're like, I don't want to walk on the grass. They definitely didn't have rights to film in those yards. That's true. Mm -hmm. Eventually, he leads them to a planter where they wrap a hose around his neck. Joyce sees the end of the hose moving around and follows it to the kids trying to murder Timmy. Debbie notices Joyce first. Don't! You'll hurt him! Let him go! Hey, what are you guys doing? He was throwing rocks at us! You were choking him, weren't you? Nah, we were just playing. She says she's going to call the sheriff, so I guess there is a new sheriff already. There's a new sheriff in town. Yeah. And tell them what Curtis did, but Curtis reminds her that her words mean shit in Meadowvale. Also, at this point, Joyce does not suspect Debbie. Right. She lets the murderous children go in the same direction as her brother, but apparently he's okay later. In the fort in Debbie's backyard, she glues a picture of Joyce into the new scrapbook. Apparently this one follows death note rules where you put the picture in before they die. We cut to Joyce's garage where she's sharpening scissors on a machine when Debbie walks up to inform her that Mrs. Brody is home from the hospital. First of all, why would Joyce care? Second of all, what was the point of her brief hospitalization? Nothing has happened since she left that needed her out of the picture. And I can't wait for these extra sharpened scissors to come into play. Right, yeah. Debbie says her mom is going to see a shrink tonight and that she'll need Joyce and Timmy to babysit her. Joyce says she'll be there. At Debbie's place, presumably after Debbie's bedtime, Joyce flips the switch to lock all the doors at night and puts on her chunky headphones to sit next to her sleeping brother on the couch. Curtis and Steve appear out the window, and Steve whips out the gun. It's bulletproof glass, you idiot! They knock on the window, and Debbie unlocks the front door for them. Curtis goes to work on the security system. Steve cuts the phone line, but not on the outside of the house. He just chops a cord coming out of a phone jack in the house, which would only disable whatever phone cord is connected. Maybe they only had one phone. No, a no phone they use a phone in the office. bedroom. Oh, that's true. And then they return to the living room with the gun. Timmy awakens just in time to tell his sister to duck, but it doesn't really matter because she doesn't hear him and Curtis misses by a mile. Debbie wraps the jump rope around Timmy's neck and Joyce hits her in the face with a lamp, knocking her to the ground. Curtis wastes the rest of his bullets into the wall because he's a horrible shot. Miss Davis must have just been luck. Joyce and Timmy race to the security system, but the key is missing so they can't unlock the doors. Curtis returns with the freshly reloaded gun and continues missing them by a long shot. Debbie emerges from her favorite hiding place in the cabinet to drop a jump rope around Joyce's neck. But she breaks free, and the two barricade themselves in Beverly's room. Suddenly, Curtis is firing bullets through the wall at them. Lots now, without bothering to reload. I think I counted 12 shots from this revolver. And he's aiming very high. Joyce tries the phone in Beverly's room, and it magically doesn't work either. Debbie lines up another arrow shot and fires it into the room. She patiently lines up a third shot. Why aren't they closing the closet door? The, the, like, they, 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 do, they know that the hole's there. They yeah. know that arrows are coming in. But then they strategically stand to let one of the other kids into the room. Yeah, but before that even, Timmy jams a hand mirror through the hole. Yeah. Like, that's going to block anything. Like, it's not just going to fall out immediately because the person on the other side gets to decide how long that mirror is there. I, I thought that they were going to lure the other kid in so that he gets into the arrow path. <laughs> that would work, too. <laughs> would have and shot. Joyce stands around a corner as Steven continues to force his way into the room. She picks up an enormous fishbowl with no fish in it, just a bunch of seaweed. And for the first time, I thought she had a solid plan. Debbie effortlessly pushes the hand mirror out of the hole and pokes another arrow through. When Steven gets close enough to Joyce's hiding position, she fucking splashes him with the water from the fish tank. <laughs> Just smash it over his head. <laughs> yeah. What are you doing? I thought for sure that kid was just going to be smashed to yeah. pieces. But instead, she's just like, water. That'll now you're get him. all wet. She just watched <laughs> Wizard of Oz yesterday. <laughs> Is that a MacGruber reference? <laughs> ha ha ha, now you're all wet. <laughs> Steve is so disoriented by the water that they're able to lock him in a chest before leaving the room. 
Joyce suggests they find Sheriff Brody's gun just before we hear it firing in the hallway they just escaped to, where Curtis last had it. Somehow she doesn't realize that's what Curtis is using. Yeah, well, I mean, she thinks that he just has a gun, though, that he brought because he has... But he has a toy gun. Oh, but he switched the toy gun out for the real yeah. gun. Yeah, and, and I don't know where she thought Curtis got this gun, if not from the parent of the other murderous child. Yeah. And how does she know where Sheriff Brody keeps his gun? And how to get into the cabinet. Like, did he teach you that when you babysat once? Like, if you need a gun, it's right up here. Curtis has them up against the door with the gun drawn, but the gun clicks out of ammo. Timmy tackles him to the ground. You should have got six to you. Or 12. Um, he just fired 13 <laughs> shots after the last reload. Joyce gets him hogtied while Debbie watches from across the living room. She takes the gun, opens up the security panel, and just starts wailing on the electronics with the butt of the gun. Which, good news, unlocks all the doors and windows. Bad news, allows Debbie to discreetly exit the house into the night. This is the weirdest, worst security system ever. Yeah. Like, I don't even understand how it's traditionally supposed to work because there's a key in it. Yeah. But they always leave the key in it normally. Right. Like in this instance, they the kids took it out. So if the point of this thing is to keep people in your house, what's to stop them from turning the turning key, the on key the and leaving? And if and if somebody were to walk in, like if it's any sort of alarm system, all they have to do is turn the key and, and your now, alarm system's and off. And the alarm system's going off. I it, don't understand it, this. It might as well be a light switch. The only thing that I could see that is perhaps something that we didn't see a lot of houses in my neighborhood have uh glass windows in there on the front door and so for the deadbolts it's the kind of deadbolt like you had at your old place where it's a key required on both sides yeah um because those are those are usually those for easily reached around and broken through windows to unlock the deadbolts right so they kept the key in it all day but at night when they went to bed, they took the key, the key out. They take the oh, key out. Okay. Um, so we only saw them with the security system operating during the day or when somebody was actively in the rooms. So it's possible that they would take this key to bed with them uh-huh. uh, when the house was secure for the night. Sexy. <laughs> Joyce sends Timmy across the street to call the police from a neighbor's house. Debbie watches all this from a tree in the yard and suddenly sees her mom pull up to the house. Mommy, Mommy, Curtis and Stephen did some terrible things, and Joyce is gonna blame me too! Now, sweetie, calm down. Know exactly what happened. When Mrs. Brody sees the cops pull up, she backs away with the only family she has left. I, I, I had a lot of problems with this too. It's like, why not just say, Joyce is going crazy and tied up Timmy and Stephen, or Curtis and Stephen, yeah. and she's shooting up the house. And like, she killed Beverly. Yeah, it's because like, she likes Willard. Yeah, there's so many easy fixes. There, there's to this. easy, easy outs for all of this because she's already been discredited. Yeah, and I put away that poison because for some reason Joyce had it on the table next to the cake. Yeah. The next day, we see the boys escorted from the police station to a car and likely to jail or some kind of incarceration. Again, why? Did they confess? All I don't know. Ha- I mean, the- if they're sociopathic enough, then they might have confessed because they don't see a reason not to. That's true. But they seem pretty secretive about everything. Because, uh, again, Joyce is supposed to be discredited. But yeah. There have been no consequences for that discreditation. I mean, at least Joyce has a witness in the form of Timmy. Yeah. Who can corroborate everything well, she said, even all the separated. physical evidence around the house. Yeah. <laughs> Like a wet little boy in a trunk and a yeah. hogtied Curtis. <laughs> yeah. You <laughs> just you just left one kid like gimped in the trunk. I wouldn't even mention him. I would just push him back into the closet and close the door. <laughs> they just find him a week later. We cut out of town where Debbie is cranking up a jack beside a small roadside motel. It sounds like Debbie has completely convinced her mother that she was going to be blamed for the killings. So Mrs. Brody has come up with a new name for her. Beth Simpson which is weirdly close to what her older sister Bev's name would have been if she had married her boyfriend Willard Simpson. She would have been Bev Simpson, and now her daughter's name is Beth Simpson. Beth Simpson promises never to talk to strangers again, and as the car pulls away, we push in on the moving truck behind the motel, and we see a man crushed under the axle of the truck because Debbie stole the jack she was playing with from under it, 
we hold on the dead guy for a moment and then we fade to black i actually really like this final reveal because she's just playing with it like it's a silly toy and we see that she killed a guy with it i mean i like i like that reveal i don't understand the mom here though like she totally just like i guess she's she had some sort of mental breakdown when her husband and daughter were killed but like I think I don't know. that it just seems like a weird switch to be like, okay, I don't have any idea what happened, so let's just go and run away and change your names forever. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I will continue to protect you. Yeah, she only has one egg left in her basket, and it's this kid. And so, whatever she says, yep, that's reality. Let's go. Let's go with it. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna spend my the rest of my life arguing with my only surviving family. Yeah, but I'm just like. If, if, if like one of our kids walks out to me after I got home from work and be like, they're all going to, they're all going to blame me for murder. I'm not just going to throw them in the car and drive and never come back and be like, we're other people now. That's the (laughs) difference between you and me. (laughs) I make this look good. And obviously that's much harder to do today to just become a different person. I think about it this way though. Honestly, uh, I die. And then one of our kids dies, and then another one of our kids dies, and the last one tells you that they're going to be blamed for murder. So they're all you have left. You're not going to run away and start a new I, life I in another state? I think I have state? more questions before, <laughs> before we get in the car. You can ask questions and drive at the same time. You're, you're losing time for every question you ask without the car started. This is fun. No, not really. I thought it was fun. Eh. I, I feel very misled for a movie called Bloody Birthday, in which the birthday is the least bloody day of all. <laughs> That's really, true. There wasn't really any blood. Well, I guess there the was... The only blood was when the lady got her eye busted in. Was and there was like was a nail little... polish. Oh, right. The nail polish <laughs> exploded from her... From her... Eyeball. What, what, did, what do we call that, Richard? What have we been calling that on the show? Uh, the orbit? The orbit. There you go. <laughs> I don't even like that word. Never mind. <laughs> Eye socket. <laughs> That's the, the all the blood we saw came from Julie Brown's eye socket, and uh, uh, there was also, I guess, technically a circle on the forehead of naked dude. That that was practically wearing underwear. Still, he was so white, just like, in this one zone. I don't feel like the children were particularly creepy. I think Debbie was. I think they did a really good job with her. She reminded me so much of the Bad Seed, the way she plays the character. I, I think Curtis was also pretty menacing. Steven is the one who has like very few lines. Yeah, he doesn't get any. to do much. Yeah, they, they, they definitely favored Debbie and Curtis. At that point, just have it be two kids. Yeah, it might as well. But that's not really a phenomenon. Two children born at the same time. That's true. <laughs> Neither is three, if you ask me. <laughs> Lots of people are born yeah. at the same time. I don't know. I feel like the it what it wasn't. The, the plot was thin, the acting wasn't all that great, and the, you know, like, it wasn't campy enough, and it wasn't gory enough, and it wasn't, like, it wasn't, over the, it wasn't over the top in any they way. They should have killed more people in funnier ways. There should have been more gore. Um, I understand why there's as little gore as there is because there's kids on set. It's hard to mm-hmm. do gore with yeah. kids around um, and not be flagrantly inappropriate. But I do think that they make up some of that low rating with all the nudity because it's good to have a lot of nudity in these movies if you're not going to have a lot of blood. So they they balance the scales a little bit that way. There's more nudity in here than there has been in most of the slashers that we've dealt with. Um, but I also just like the killer kid genre. Um, I don't dislike the killer kid genre. I just think that this was kind of weak. Yeah, I think these these kids could have been a little bit more menacing than they were. They were just kind of sweet kids who were capable of murder. I, I, I think that they needed to be more devious with their murders, where all of their murders just seem like murders of opportunity. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Like it, like they had they had this whole thing like a scrapbook. It was like, oh, we're going to kill the teacher. It's just like, oh, what kind of crazy plan are they going to come with killing the teacher? Oh, they're just going to shoot, shoot her, her in the back. <laughs> I was like, okay, that wasn't as impressive as i was hoping it would yeah, be yeah 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 um and and again when they discredit uh you know uh joyce i thought there was gonna be something coming out of that and i think it would have been more interesting to actually have poisoned the cake yeah and everyone's like vomiting at the birthday party yeah, yeah, yeah. and kill everybody 
or, or have it look like Guyana, just like <laughs> everybody's just erupting blood all over the party. Yeah, just like uh, what was it? Uh, uh, Hateful Eight. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> just, just vomiting this blood fountains. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm not a horror guy, as you know, uh, but I, I definitely didn't feel anything about these murders. Yeah. Uh, we don't set up any of the victims well enough before they die. Yeah. And and like the Beverly character is so poorly written that it's just like, I get naked in front of this window mm-hmm. and I got a boyfriend. Oh, someone's spying on me? Oh, anyway. Yeah, and, and the whole like killing Beverly in their own house when it's just them in the house, like the whole, the, you know, don't don't shit where you eat kind of thing. Yeah, don't like, kill where you eat. Yeah, I was like, why, why are you going through all this trouble to kill people out away and you're slowly bringing the murders closer and closer to where you live to the point where they're actually in the next room. Right. It's almost as if they're 10-year-olds. But, <laughs> I, no, and I agree. 10-year-olds should be better at killing people. This is 8-year-old bullshit. <laughs> don't shoot where you eat. That's better. Yeah. I don't think it was very good. It's not a thumbs up for me. It's a thumbs up for me. Nah, it's a down for me. Um, what are we thinking letterboxed? Um, I don't need to watch this one again. It's not particularly high. I have it at number 39 out of 49 for the year. It is below Modern Romance and above Improper Channels. Okay. Uh, I am putting this at 45. So it is below Miss 45 (laughs) (laughs) Uh, and above Maniac. All right. Um, I have it much higher. I have it in 28th out of 49 which is just under eyewitness and just above underground aces um i asked you guys to bring your three favorite kid killers to the table today um i think uh well why don't we go around in a circle and and say what our number ones were jesse who was your number one killer kid uh well i had to pick uh mccullough culkin in the good son it's a good choice I had a lot of problems with this one because I don't know many killer kid movies. Or, sure. Um, so I had to kind of just go with what I knew. Um, and I went with Shersha Ronan from Neil Jordan's Byzantium, where she is a vampire. Uh, and so she does actively kill in that. That counts. I consider that. Uh, I went with Gage from Pet Cemetery um, because he's so young. Um, but I remember the first time I saw that movie, way too young to see that movie, <laughs> that it scared the fuck out of me yeah, when the yeah. kid came back and started growling at everybody and killing people. Uh, also, all the cuts of just the trucks going by. Yeah. Like, uh, that movie just, uh, every time. Brrr. Yeah. I still haven't seen the remake, but. It, it's it's okay. It's watchable. It's Lithgow replacing the monster guy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or the and monster Jason guy. Clark is the father. Oh, okay. Who I like. Um, who was your number two, Jess? Um, so I picked the girl from Let the Right One In. So I guess I went with a similar route as vampire. Vamp- vampire girl. Uh, the the remake of that was on my list because that's the only one I've seen oh. with, with Chloe Grace. You should see the original. It's I, better. That's that's what everyone tells me, and I and I agree. I should see it. Yeah. Um, but that's not what I my number two. My number two is an ensemble. Uh, The Brood. Okay. David Cronenberg's The Brood. That's a good choice. Uh, my number two, and I don't know how well this fits the category either, but I went with Takako Chigusa from Battle Royale. Oh, That's okay. the Chiaki Kiriyama character who, I mean, I guess technically she's killing in self-defense, but she seems very good at it. Yeah. Um, and uh, was, she the, was she the honeypot one? Yes. Okay. Uh, who is just a complete psychopath. Um, and uh, she's great. And then Quentin Tarantino used her as uh, Gogo Yubari in mm-hmm. Kill Bill. Uh, Jess, what's your number three? Um, so I have a soft spot for the Children of the Corn movies. <laughs> I still haven't seen any of them. But well, we will watch them all. <laughs> Stephen King's good, though. I mean, uh, he got my number one slot. Yeah, and I think that I have I have a really weird soft spot for the third one. Is that the urban one? It is the urban one because I saw it the most because that came out in like 95. So that was the one that like I watched in my childhood. Um, 
But I did pick uh, Malachi from the original one, so we'll, we'll we'll get to that one soon. He's like the the older redheaded creepy boy. See, the one that I'm the most eager to watch is actually the second one because there's a gif from that movie that people use all the time of an old woman in a wheelchair just getting rocketed through the front window of a restaurant <laughs> and it makes me laugh every time I see it and I need to see the movie that it's from eventually. Uh, what was your number two, Richard? Uh, three, you mean? Or, sorry, three. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my number three is uh, she, I guess she, I would consider her a scream queen. Um, although most of her movies that she was scream queens of were before she was like 15. Uh, the actress is Jodel Furland. And while she played many characters, like she played the creepy girl in silent Hill. Um, she's the voice of the little sister. She was in Tideland, Terry Gilliam's Tideland. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, but the scary movie that I'm picking for her is cabin in the woods in which she played Patience Buckner, the one-armed hatchet girl whose diary that they read from to activate the whole thing. Oh, okay. Because uh, she's just really great in that. She's also the voice of the the witch from Paranorman. Uh, oh, okay. The the young witch at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so she and she's got all kinds of like horror films on her on her slate, you know. But before she was, you know, yeah. an adult. Uh, but I like I just like Patience Buckner because she comes because she makes it through the whole movie like she <laughs> that she just comes in at the end and she's still like slowly dragging herself by yeah. the ratchet. Uh, my number three, I went with Matilda from Roald Dahl's Matilda. No, from Leon the Professional. Oh, <laughs> um, because she's a killer and she's a kid and yeah. she gets trained how to be an assassin. Yeah. Um. And she's wonderful. I really like Natalie Portman in the role. Um, I know that uh, Luke Besson's kind of awful, um, generally, as a person. But it's a wonderful film. And uh, she really brings a lot to the performance of the character and everything. I also felt like, as far as killer kids go, you could have gone with Chloe Grace Moretz in Kick-Ass, too. Oh, that's true, yeah. She kills a lot of people in that. Um, and she also kills people in uh, Sweeney Todd, probably, right? Or not? Is that the one? Uh, no, not no, Sweeney Todd. Dark uh, Shadows. Dark Shadows. There you go. Mm. Uh, but yeah, Matilda was my number three. Um, on Discord, Sir Husk went with Village of the Damned as a number one. And then The Brood and Extro was his third option. I don't know Extro. I don't know what that is. <laughs> I'm going to show you guys the trailer after we record this because it's pretty ridiculous. But he also had an honorable mention for Alice Sweet Alice. Uh, because of a twist, I can't explain why that didn't technically fit the category. Ariana 03 went with Children of the Corn. Benny suggested X-23 from Logan, because she kills a lot of people. Oh, yeah, she does. Uh, Tanya went with The Bad Seed as number one, The Hunger Games as number two, and mm. Carrie as number three. Well, Carrie's a good one. Yeah. Ian Graham said Little Anakin and Phantom Menace, because <laughs> he kills a bunch of people working on the Death Star. Or... Is it the Death Star? No, no it's uh, it's one of the uh, Trade Federation ships. But yeah, there definitely were people on there. Yeah. Ray Hughes went with The Brood also. Steven Sperling threw a ton of titles at me, but I think he settled on uh, David Zellaby as played by Martin Stevens from Village of the Damned. Uh, on Twitter, Dr. Butcher MD had another vote for Bad Seed. Helen went with Reagan from The Exorcist. Switch the Envelope podcast went with Damien from The Omen. Q-U-I-Q-U-E mentioned Quien Puede Matar a Un Niño, a.k.a. Who Can Kill a Child. Wyndham Jennings picked Orphan. Uh, Mr. McGrath went with Children of the Corn 3, Urban Harvest. So yeah, somebody else likes got, that it one. hit the list. Mr. Patrick, Patrick McGrath put the that one The third one is, is just special. All right. <laughs> I'm going to take your word for it. And Mackenzie Lambert went with The Children. Oh, yeah. So well, there we go. It's another solid choice. And I'm assuming that's a five-way tie between all the kids because they're all kind of great. Our writer-director here was Ed Hunt. After this, he directed Alien Warrior, The Brain, and Halloween Hell. The writer, Barry Pearson, did Firebird 2015 AD, released only in Madison. He also wrote The Brain for Director Hunt. Music was from Arlen Ober. He was the composer for X-Ray next season, Eating Raul, and Crime Wave, which we were just talking about the cohen Ramey co-production right right cinematographer stephen l posey he was the dp of slumber party massacre 
Penitentiary 2, Bloodsong next season, that horror film written by Luca Brazzi, and later Savage Streets and Friday the 13th, A New Beginning. The editor here was Anne E. Mills. She's the editor of Bloodsong, and later Hamburger the Motion Picture. Lori Lethen played Joyce Russell. She was Denise Dalbert in The Day After. That's the TV movie about the end of the world. Julie Brown was Beverly Brody. We had her last season as Candy in Any Which Way You Can. And this season she was apparently in one of the commercials in Incredible Shrinking Woman. Later she's in Police Academy 2, Earth Girls Are Easy, and Shakes the Clown. And she's Miss Stoger, the PE teacher in Clueless. She also voices Lisa in a Goofy movie. I also know she was the the voice of Celine, which was an Aladdin animated series character. Oh, okay. And I was like, oh, okay, I know Celine. That's fun. Joe Penny played Mr. Harding. He's back as Officer Phil Buckwald in SOB later this season. Burt Kramer played Sheriff James Brody. He played the Los Angeles Fire Chief in Volcano. Casey Martell played Timmy Russell. He's Greg in E.T. And he's also Greg in Amityville Horror. Maybe yeah. the same Greg? Who knows? <laughs> Can't he just beam up? This is reality, Greg. <laughs> Elizabeth Hoy plays Debbie Brody. She's one of the daughters in Blues Brothers that Jake tries to buy. <laughs> How much for the women? <laughs> She's back next season in X-Ray as young Susan. Billy Jane played Curtis Taylor. He's also in X-Ray as young Harry. Brett Camber in Cujo. Buddy Griffith in Just One of the Guys. Brad Langford in Silver Spoons. Mikey Randall in Parker Lewis Can't Lose. And he was Rudy Stein on the Bad News Bears TV series. We saw him earlier this season as the kid who stole Sally Field's wallet in Backroads when the people gave them a ride. He's part of an acting family who seemed to be credited half the time with the surname Jane and half the time as Jacoby. His sister Laura Jacoby shows up in Valley Girl, Rad, and Punchline. Half-brother Scott Jacoby played the titular Bad Ronald in that film. And his brother Bobby Jacoby plays Melvin Plug in the Tremors franchise, appearing in the first and third installments. His now ex-wife April Wayne is also an actress who appeared in MacGyver episode The Eraser as a bartender. That's the scene where MacGyver meets the Eraser and he fixes the jammed soda gun at the yeah, bar. Yeah. Susan Strasberg played Miss Viola Davis. She's the daughter of famous acting coach Lee Strasberg. She was Fran in Roller Coaster and Joanne Morgan in Sweet Sixteen. Jose Ferrer played the Doctor. He was Emperor Shaddam IV in Dune. He's Cyrano in Cyrano de Bergerac, for which he won his Oscar. And he plays Lieutenant Barney Greenwald, the defense attorney in the Kane Mutiny. There was a Doctor in this movie? He's he's seen running up to the hospital during the eclipse. Oh, that's it? <laughs> and, yeah. Well, and then... There's a big name for that one shot. <laughs> yeah. And then he talks over the eclipse montage. Hmm. Ben Marley plays Duke Benson. He was Patrick in Jaws 2 and Young John in Apollo 13. Eric Hope plays Annie Smith. She's back as Diana in Graduation Day, just around the corner. Ellen Gear played Madge. She's Sunshine Door. That's the hippie girl that Harold's mom sets him up with to do the Romeo and Juliet scenes, who stabs herself in Harold and Maude. She was also Louise in our Minnesota review of On the Nickel. She's Rose in Clear and Present Danger and Bonnie in Phenomenon. William Boyette, uh, doesn't say what character he played, but he has lots of credits dating back to the early 50s. He's a government liaison in The Rocketeer. He's Judge Move-Along Monaghan in The Newsies, and he's the desk sergeant in Theodore Rex. <laughs> Shane Butterworth played a classmate. He was Gary Tuscan in Exorcist II The Heretic and Timmy Lupus on the Bad News Bears TV series. Ward Costello played Mr. Taylor. He was General Marshall in MacArthur, and General Rogers in Firefox. We'll see him again later this season for Whose Life Is It Anyway? Michael Dudikoff was in this movie. Yeah. He played Willard. He was Millie's houseboy in our Minnesota review of The Black Marble. He's a conscript in Tron, but he's likely best known as Joe from Golan Globus' American Ninja series, where he appears in the first, second, and fourth installments. He played Robert Scandal Jackson on a TV series called Cobra. But here he was Beverly's boyfriend, who we only see sitting slightly out of frame as someone's watching them through the peephole. Cyril O'Reilly played Paul. That's Lori's boyfriend. He was a soldier in Airplane and Tim in Porky's and Porky's 2. 
Ruth Silviera played Dr. Newell's nurse in Oh God Book 2 and Second Lady Shockley in First Family last year. She's also credited as an announcer in THX 1138. Sylvia Wright played the girl in the van. She was Carol in Terror on Tour from the makers of Home Sweet Home. John Avery played the guy in the van. He's Danny in Wacko, which is a Graydon Clark film we'll be getting to soon. And he was Aaron on Arc 2. Nathan Roberts played a reporter in The Formula, but we don't have a credit for him in this movie. I think that's everything for Bloody Birthday. If you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd. Where, as I said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. We also have a Discord now. Join the 24-7 movie chat and share your thoughts on episodes past, present, and future at VintageVideoPodcast.com slash Discord. And if you're listening on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Friday the 13th Part 2, which IMDb describes like so. Mrs. Voorhees is dead, and Camp Crystal Lake is shut down but a camp next to the infamous place is getting stalked by an unknown assailant. We leave you now with a trailer for Friday the 13th, Part 2. On a June night in 1980, Friday the 13th, 12 of her friends were murdered. Why should Friday the 13th, 1981, be any different? Friday the 13th, part two. The body count continues. 14. All doomed. You're all doomed. Fifteen. God. Sixteen. Help! Seventeen. Eighteen. Nineteen. Twenty. Twenty-one. Twenty-two. Twenty-three. Sandra? Jeff? The day you count on for terror is not over. Friday the 13th, part two. Sphinx? Sphinx? Sphinx?